Welcome in to the eighth and final episode of the AAF show. This is the Defiance and the Alliance. As you may all have heard, the AAF will be no more. Darren Ravel reported on Tuesday, April 2nd, that the AAF, the Alliance of American Football, will be suspending all operations indefinitely. The league sent all their players packing without even paying them to go home. Can you imagine that? A league with non-guaranteed three-year contracts, forcing players to pay for their own flights. What happened to the state of the art health insurance? What happened to giving players an education stipend after one year in the league? Oh, I forgot. The league didn't even complete one year. Derek? How did this all play out from the very beginning of the season, this eight-game-long season? How did it come to this? First and foremost, I would like to say this is an absolute tragedy. My heart goes out towards all the players and staff members and also the journalists involved in this league. They were sold a false prophecy. They were sold a mirage. A lot of people will predictably point fingers at a supposed lack of talent or lack of care towards the league, but in actuality, the blame rests on the shoulders of three men. Co-founders Bill Polian and Charlie Ebersol for going to business with two shady men, and Tom Dundon, the false prof who came in and pretended to save the league at the 11th hour, but in actuality, left at the first sign of cracks in the armor. In your opinion, why do you feel as if this supposed alliance disbanded so quickly? Derek, it is very true that this entire league was set up on very weak infrastructure. It was on thin ice from the very get-go because of one investor basically running the show. And once he pulled out, the entire house of cards folded. It seems as if Mr. Bill Polian, an NFL Hall of Famer himself, and Charlie Ebersol, whose biggest credential in his career is dating Maria Sharapova briefly in 2008, it seems as if these two men pretty much put their entire stack of cards in the hands of an investor. And the first investor, who was not known until Rovell's report yesterday on the Action Network, was none other than Reggie Fowler, a man who had a very shady involvement in the Minnesota Vikings. He tried to actually purchase the Vikings in 2005, and he eventually left the Vikings in 2014 after he accumulated a debt of over $60 million. So my question is, what in the world possessed Bill Polian and Charlie Ebersol to entrust a guy who half a decade ago had over $60 million in debt? What the hell were they thinking? And this man was supposed to invest $170 million Guess how much he actually invested in the league? $28 million. So you know what happened two weeks into the season? They went crying for help, and that's when Tom Dundon finessed them. Within weeks of taking majority ownership of the league, he seemingly tried to stronghold the NFLPA into providing practice squad players for the AAF, which makes no type of logistical sense. Also, Dundon pledged $250 million towards the league, but he only ended up giving $70 million, all of which was used towards the player payroll. None of the league's vendors have been paid, and it's unsure who is going to be paid at this time. Besides the fact that these men placed the entire chance of success of their new shiny football league on a pair of shady investors, another reason why this entire project failed so miserably was because of the markets teams were placed in. Birmingham, Memphis, San Diego, not good football markets, Derek. And what happened? They were either bad teams, bad attendances, bad ratings, or most likely, all three. The one lone bright spot in the Lone Star State was San Antonio. The commanders had fun fact the top four attendances in the league in its eight-week span. It's because it's in a market that actually wants a professional football team, and they showed it and they proved it. In San Antonio, what state is that in? Remind me, kind of going blank. Texas, it's in the Texas. Texas, the most passionate football state in America. It is football capital of the world. That is key, Derek. Sports is an entertainment industry. And like any industry, it is ran on one key element, and that is supply and demand. 
when there's not demand for something in an area, you don't put a team there. Like Memphis, San Diego. The majority of this league is located in cities that have no business being in the discussion of having any professional football team just because of the simple reasoning of supply and demand. That is the AAF's fault, and they should have seen failure coming when they're placing a team in a market that is bound for failure. San Antonio was their best move. Now, a whole different question for you, Derek, be it in the spring, be it in the summer, whatever it may be, do you think that people actually want an alternative league or even a developmental league? Our audience members, maybe because they're listening to this AAF show, but all Americans, in your experience in this show and seeing the AAF for its eight-week span, what is your opinion? Well, I think the first notion that people will run to in regards to the failure of this league is that, oh, nobody cared, or that, oh, the players in this league are so much worse than the players in the NFL. But last time I checked, isn't Mark Sanchez still on the NFL roster? Yes, he is. The man with the butt fumble is still on the NFL roster, and you're telling me that Garrett Gilbert, who's absolutely lighting the AAF on fire, the UT legend himself, who's only had four passes so far in his NFL career, still only 27. I don't care if he looks like a librarian off the street. He is lighting the league on fire with over 2,000 yards, He's well on pace to be, or he was on pace to be the league's MVP until Mr. Tom Dundon just pulled the plug out of nowhere. You're telling me he doesn't deserve an opportunity? How about Charles Johnson, a wide receiver on the league champions Orlando Apollos? Yes, he's 30 years old, but he's absolutely lit the league on fire as well. Gilbert and Johnson are looking like Peyton Manning and Marvin Harrison in their heyday. It's clear that players in this league have talent and they deserve a chance at the quote-unquote big time, which is the NFL. How's Trent Richardson doing in the AEF? He's leading the league with 11 touchdowns. That's how he's doing. And did I mention that he had a 2.9 yards per carry stat through the entire season? And that is because the talent level of these players are just subpar. And I understand that as a developmental league, that is fair because that's what it's meant to be, is to have players that aren't on the same talent level as that as the pros. Why the hell is anyone going to sit there on their couch and watch these players go at it? Just because they miss football? No. When you have the NBA going on and then the MLB, so whether it's the spring football or summer football, whatever it may be, nobody is going to sit around and watch subpar talent running around for an entire season. Maybe at one game, sure. But man, when it's getting to that grind of the season and it's just the same every week, you don't have that same appreciation because you're not seeing Odell out there making one-handed snacks. You're watching Trent Richardson, the Crimson Turtle, make 2.9 yards per carry every single run. And that, my friends, I don't care how many touchdowns that guy makes, we're not watching it. There are stars in the AEF, but even the stars of the AEF, you put Garrett Gilbert on an NFL field with an NFL caliber secondary that he's throwing at, he's going to be freaking torched. The competition level is just not there. However, I think we've also seen that fans have taken quite the interest to this league. If you recall in week one, Mike Berkovici of Jail Mary fame at Arizona State nearly had his head decapitated in the worst massacre that San Antonio has seen since the Alamo. And if I recall, that clip went absolutely viral as a lot of people expressed their desire to see a more brutal league than the NFL's version of football in 2019. You mentioned week one. Well, I'll tell you this, week one, my friend, was an anomaly. The first primetime game for the AEF this season had a rating of 2.1, which is even higher than anybody would have expected, and tied the primetime NBA game that night. However, the XFL, created by WWE chairman Vince McMahon, their season was in 2001, just a one-year stint, just like... AAF, if not just a tad bit longer, since the AAF is now ending after eight games and not a full season, and players had to be sent home, and they had to pay for their own flights. The XFL, back in 2001, their debut game. Now remember, 2.1 for AAF, very strong. What was the rating for their debut game? 8.1. That is remarkable. However, by the end of the season, 
What was the rating? Far less than even two. So you see, debut weeks cannot just tell what the attraction is going to be for the rest of the season. You cannot just say, hey, there was this one big hit that went viral week one by some San Antonio commander, and that made the AAF just go big week one. Because at the end of the day, it didn't matter what people thought week one. It mattered what people thought week five and week six and week seven when it's really getting into the season. It's the nitty gritty because it's going to really decide, is this league capable of carrying on for an entire season and prolonging interest of football fans in an alternative league? Something that the failed XFL was unable to do. Now, I mentioned the XFL, Derek. Vince McMahon, WWE chairman, announced in 2017 that the XFL will be reopening for a 2020 season with only the title and the logo being the same. No more gimmicks as the XFL was basically being a circus. Does the failure of the AAF foreshadow the downfall of the XFL next year? So you're trying to say that an alternative NFL league has no chance. No chance in hell. But I beg to differ. I don't know how to say this without sounding a bit rude, but the NFL's old man's gentleman club that seemingly has no type of care towards the issue of the oppressed Colin Kaepernick getting down on one knee seemingly sent millions of people into sheer state of anger when there's millions of people in the inner cities going through absolutely unbelievable cases of oppression, marginalization, dare I say, mortality. R.I.P. Nipsey Hussle, by the way. Any spring league or summer league is doomed to fail and Vince McMahon is not going to be able to trump those simple issues that plague the AEF. Now he's trying to take the property of AEF, the equipment, the players. McMahon will fail, XFL will fail. You can't take players from an already failed project and just hope that it's going to work for yours because your mindset is different. It will die down just like every spring league project does. Let me ask you one thing. When has this, when has Vince McMahon ever failed? Are you serious? 2001. 2001? XFL. Exactly. So you're telling me that Vince McMahon, after seeing both the failures of the AAF and recognizing the failures of his own previous XFL incarnation nearly 20 years ago, won't, won't learn from that and turn the next XFL into a successful alternative to the NFL? If you think that you're wrong, you're honestly wrong, and it's been proven that people are kind of disillusioned with the NFL right now. So there's definitely a demographic that Mr. McMahon can tap into. He learned from his prior mistakes. And he's going to, I promise you, I promise you this. The XFL will be on NBC. It will be on TNT. And I promise you that by 2025, there will be at least five pro bowlers in the league. They will jump ship from the NFL to the XFL. Because you know why? People are tired of the NFL not caring about the real issues in life. Whether it's CTE, whether it's getting mad about a braided dude, or whether he's wearing an afro, or whatever the hell he's wearing that day, getting mad at a guy taking a knee. Nah! No disrespect to Vince McMahon. However, you can't make a bad product good. You can make an okay product good. You can't put that kind of talent on a football field and expect that people will watch it for an entire season, for entire seasons, just because they miss football. Because they'll go watch basketball. They'll go watch baseball. They'll go watch college basketball. Whatever they gotta do, but they're not gonna watch bad talent. Because what's really fun about sports is not necessarily what the sport is. It's about the people in it. And any time that anyone sits on their couch and sees an AAF game or sees an XFL game, they're just going to yawn and just turn the channel. And that is why any developmental league is not going to be getting anywhere near the ratings to actually be a stable organization for years to come. The players deserve it. The coaches deserve it. Hell, the fans deserve it. But they don't want it. Our final show, the Defiance. the Defiance and the Alliance, is now complete. Feel free to give your opinion in the comment section. Let us have it. Let us hear your opinion. To all of our listeners out there, 
It's been eight fun weeks. We thank you for every click and every listen. Alongside Derek Udenzi, I'm Nick Walters, and this was The Defiance in the Alliance on The AAF Show.